Printy virtual tasting, Friday afternoon, four o'clock. Um, you may know for those um, very keen viewers, and those with a keen eye, that we, um, we're still in the packing shed, but we have moved from one dark corner to another dark corner. Gone is the picture of me behind me, which was a bit we've, disappointing. We've banished Dave as well. And we've removed Dave from the scene. And today we've got the, um, the old apple picking aprons. Um, don't get a lot of use anymore. But uh, could, could go straight back into service. Um, Drew and Ed, back with you here today. And um, oh, we, now don't forget the stick. And our, Before the fan base and gets our, uppity about not mentioning the stick. And our lovely assistant behind the camera, she's here again as well. <laughs> None of this happens without her, obviously. Um, look, today we're talking all things Pinot Gris. Or Grigio. Or Grigio. We Whoa. just call it Gris. Gosh, that just sort of, that could kick us right off anyway. Um, we've got today, and hopefully those that have got their um, tasting packs have got two wines in front of them, our Mountain Range um, Pinot Gris and our Topography Pinot Gris. Now, I recommend today actually having two glasses per person so that you can have them side by side because yeah. it's quite a good comparison, these two. Um, same vintage. Uh, yes. Yep, same vintage, but really different wines. I guess where we probably should start is a couple of perhaps lesser known details around Pinot Gris. Oh, Before, there's many of those. Yeah, probably one of the main, there's a couple of main ones. Probably one of the main ones is the fact that, despite the fact that it's a white wine, Pinot Gris is actually a red grape. Well, this goes back to the fact that the Pinot Noir family is genetically very unstable, mm. so it what it, it mutates very easily. So traditionally with viticulture, when we plant a new vineyard, we don't plant seeds out, we plant cuttings. Take and a cutting from another vine. From another vine, so you know what it is, and they all come certified with uh, clones and all sorts of stuff. They usually have a little root ball, and you shove that in the ground, and you know that you're gonna have Pinot Gris. Uh, so, this is more so with, with Pinot Noir, so it is mutated. There's Pinot Noir, there's Pinot Meunier, there is Pinot Gris, there is Pinot Blanc, uh, and there's probably other ones um, that Sussex. escape me at the moment. Yep. So what you have here is a halfway grape variety that is um, uh, quite dark coloured skin. Uh, it, it's not what I would call red. No. Or, I, it's a bit like a mauve. Yeah. It's a bit bluey, pinky. Well, I'm no, I'm no linguist, uh, but I believe Gris is French for grey. It is, as is Grigio is for Italian. Italian food. And the Germans, and there's quite a bit of Pinot Gris in Germany, call it Grau Burgunder, ah. grey Burgundy. So yes, uh, yes it, despite it not being grey, uh, everyone seems to have settled on the grey. Now in Australia, you don't. I mean, nearly every Pinot Gris I've ever drunk here in Australia has been looked like, that, looked like that in the glass. But certainly there's examples elsewhere around the world where you see quite a bit of colour. Uh, and in, in Australia, so look, I've never tried to make red wine with Pinot Gris, and uh, thank you, Stig. And uh, so I don't know what it makes red wine, but a lot of, um, a lot of winemakers sort of play around the edges and they'll leave it on skins for varying amounts of time. So you end up getting, it goes beyond a gold yellow, which most white varieties, if you leave on skin, go. And it, it actually goes a real copper orangey colour. One of the reasons I suggested two glasses today is because there is quite a, colour a difference. colour difference between these two wines. Correct. And we can get into that sort of down the track. The, the Gris Grigio thing, I mean, we've, we've adopted Gris. Yep. Um, for everyone out there who's unsure, Gris and Grigio, exactly the same thing. Yep. Just one's more the French Alsatian styling and one is more the Italian... Yes, yeah, so, so Italy, it's, is it it's, Benito? It's, uh, no, Alto Adige, which ah. is in the north uh, east corner, yep. up towards the foot of the Dolomite Mountains. Ah, yes. Uh, so quite a cool area, um, and, and a lot of those vineyards are at fairly high elevations as well, whereas um, uh, in France it's Alsace, 
right on the Rhine, just to the west of the Rhine River, borders Germany yeah. um, in the in the shadow of the Vosges Mountains. So, yeah, Gri Grigio, it's a bit like Shiraz Surah. It's the same variety, just a different name. Uh, and with the Grigio, uh, the um, you you sort of in Australia, if you've called it Grigio, you sort of indicating I suppose that this is more in the Italian style which is usually lighter more acid to a it zippy. bit zippier yeah. um, also a bit more neutral yeah. in flavor whereas if less, you, less fruit intensity yeah whereas if you go green you're sort of indicating that it's a richer style that has more more a bit of a oily texture to it yeah. um, and more flavor now historically that's because you know, my understanding in my time in Italy is that the Italian grape growers were paranoid about losing their crops, so they'd pick it at the earliest possible opportunity, right. which was acidic and slightly underripe. Uh, whereas Frenchies are a bit more laid back. They are a bit more laid back, and and even today you can't escape noticing the effect of botrytis on their wine style, which is I think where you get the richness and the, the textural difference, stuff, the yeah. viscosity of it. And the extra flavour. Um, well, I mean, we're, we're certainly, our Pinot Gris is grown at, majority of what we, we produce is grown on our own vineyards at lower yeah. elevations in orange. And we're certainly heading down that more richer, uh, more full bodied Yeah, style. most, most Gris or Grigio in Australia, uh, despite maybe trying to indicate a style, I reckon is what I'd call transitional. Somewhere sort of sits middle. somewhere in the middle to a larger or lesser degree. We, um, and, and this is what you might ask, why do you have two Pinot Gris? Um, I would call the mountain range usually a transitional style. Yep. Um, the, the topography comes from a single vineyard, only from uh, the, the original block of Pinot Gris on the estate vineyards, which would now be 25 years old, really? Mm, not quite. Not quite, but getting there, over 20 years old. Um, and it's very intentionally uh, meant to be a move to that richer yep. gray style. More of the Alsatian. More of the Alsatian. And I keep asking out of Dave, look, 5% of a trinus would be great. <laughs> but uh, we've never done it. No, and, no. and I think generally Australians are, are a bit scared about getting Botrytis in the vineyard because how do you then control it? Um, but you know, I, I'd still be quite happy to see a little bit of botrytis in we there with that richness. We have had one particular year where we removed a bit of botrytis in that block. But um, yes, I agree with you. It gets makes me very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> so look, throw a bit of the mountain range gris into your glass and, and have a bit of a taste. Yes, we've got quite a few people saying they've got their two glasses ready to go. Well, it, you can pour pour a I'll bit. Pour them both. Pour a bit in both. Um, because then you can see and contrast and compare as we go along. Um, and, and any tasting where we do two wines together, right? Yeah. And to go in the two glasses. Yeah, we just we actually just have one because we have wobbly barrels to sit on and they're not ideal. But um, the like all our mountain range stuff, this is very much about being a, a more fresh, bright, clean expression yep. of the variety and the style. Um, and I think this one sits nicely with that. Yep. Um, you can see in the in the colour, it's quite bright. You know, it's it's quite pale. There's not a lot of depth in there, um, but it's it certainly fits that mountain range kind of bill. Yeah. You know? yeah. Would you like a second glass? Oh, oh, oh. If they're on hand, that that'd be terrific. Um, yeah. So so the mountain range Pinot Gris uh, is meant to be uh, you know a, a wine uh, that will please. Um, a lot of people. Yeah. And we've certainly seen, anecdotally, Pinot Gris has been very popular in the marketplace. Yes. We certainly see in the cellar door and, and through wholesale sales that, thank you to the assistant there, um, we certainly see um, from, our, from our, you know, very small figures that, that Pinot Gris popularity is ever increasing. And in fact, Unusually for these sorts of virtual tastings, I did a little bit of background research today. Oh my god! Yeah. Why did you do that? I know I've ruined the whole concept. <laughs> but I actually did a bit of digging, and it's it's certainly it's not just us, and it's not just here that you know we're seeing an increase in the Pinot Gris popularity. The the area under vine in Australia is 
probably grown from about 400 hectares early 2000s to nearly 4,000 hectares today, um, which is a fair increase in a short amount of time. And it's actually, the Pinot Gris makes up nearly 10% of the white grape crush. Now, when we say crush, that means just the fruit that goes over the way bridge at the winery. You probably understand. Um, but for anyone out there who's a bit... Um, doesn't work that, in the industry. Doesn't work in the industry, wondering what that meant. Um, how much fruit gets crushed, made into wine. Um, but the really interesting part for me was that it still makes up... It, it actually makes up... It's our fifth most prevalent grape variety in orange. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah. So um, that'd be, I'm guessing, uh, the second most popular, most planted white grape variety behind Chardonnay. You'd be right. Chardonnay, Shiraz, Chardy, Cabernet, Merlot, Pinot Gris. Right. Oh, slash Grigio. To put that in perspective though, Chardonnay, which is our most widely crushed, planted and crushed white variety, still it makes up... leaps and bounds ahead. It makes up about 45% of all right. the white wine that we produce in Australia. So it's still, despite what people say and, you know, Chardy's maybe not on... We think it's very good and very on the rise again. Uh, it's still very popular and maintains a, well, a pretty important role. It's coming off a relatively small base 10 or 15 years ago and it, it's sort of replicating, if my understanding is it's replicating the exponential growth that Sauvignon Blanc did Correct. Yeah. prior to Pinot Gris and, and maybe people, you know, wine is fashion, maybe people got a bit, you know, eventually the exponential growth of Sauvignon Blanc had to plateau. And the next one to come along was Pinot Gris. Well, it's not. It's actually only a couple of percent behind Sauvignon Blanc. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, so it's certainly, big. it's big. certainly, certainly, um, that popularity has been reflected in the in the data. Gosh, and it, it's it's reflected in, in what we see yeah. because it. Um, Maybe you can't hold a piece of white paper up to show the colour difference. Oh, uh, the colour difference. Oh. Oh. Well, I think it, it's it's kind of it's, it's kind of difficult to show the colour difference from this. What is the colour distance? Like? But it's, um, it's certainly, uh, I'm not sure if you can see it. you're off it. camera for Instagram. <laughs> yeah, this can't is really very see. practical. People, no if you're at home, it it's yeah. darker it's white and paper. Two glasses. Yeah, two glasses and a piece of white paper and look at them at the same time over your piece of white paper like that. And you'll see that the topography has a little bit more dark, it has a darker colour and it slightly goes towards a pinky, it's got what a, we call onion skin. A coppery kind of... Yeah you know, hue. Yes, so um, onion skin. Yeah. So, um, and look, that, should I launch into how they're made? Well, I was, just gonna, I was just gonna say, in terms of how these wines are made, you know, we, there's, there's obviously, you know, wines that we do very clean and very yep. bright and fresh and they stay in stainless, and then there's ones that are very lazy and, and worked and they go into barrels. These are a little bit of a crossover uh, the, the the mountain range Pinot Gris, look, uh, when the when the weather treats us kindly, now comes from um, maybe four or five vineyards around Orange. The majority of from our own vineyards. We've got two blocks, um, so there's a few different uh, vineyards in different locations and uh, different elevations, which is good for complexity. Uh, but that's basically all fermented in stainless steel and I actually work pretty hard at actually removing the colour um, so that, and that's done naturally, uh, not, not through additions, it's done by not adding any sulphur prior to fermentation and what happens is that the, you know, you always hear oxidation is a bad thing, you actually oxidise, oxidise all the colour out of it um, so that at the end of fermentation you actually, you start with juice that's almost brown, and at the end of fermentation, you end up with that colour. Wine that is wine that is clear. that is clear and bright and and yellow, and the lees, which is all the sediment that then falls uh, via gravity to the to the bottom of the tank, is really really pink. Uh, so that's where all the colour goes. It all settles out, and we get rid of it, and and we end up with white wine, uh, and. Basically, uh, you know, it, it's a tank fermented, bright, fresh, fairly simple wine making after that. Um, and, and, you know, just trying to get the balance right. Whereas with uh, the, the topography that comes, like I said earlier, from a single block on the Printhe estate, so a single vineyard wine, uh, we add sulphur to it in the vineyard 
to actually bind up the colour. So we're doing the opposite thing. Um, we actually want to keep the, some of the colour. This is a very confusing process, Drew. This is why this is why I go to university and learn these things and experience you, count. You remember all so so we actually try to retain the colour it comes off the vine with. Um, and the other thing, this is entirely fermented in a three and eight, three thousand five hundred litre French oak barrel, uh, and it was one parcel uh, that was fermented in that that barrel that we call the Fudra. Uh, and that adds a whole other dimension uh, to, to the fermentation and to the complexity and the texture that you get. Yeah, in certainly my understanding of, you know, oak, we, and we've discussed oak in various forms in, at various times and whether we do something further down the track, I'm not sure, but certainly the fudra is about its maturation rather than giving oak influence to the wine. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, they're not charred and they're, it's about storing it in a, in a in a different environment where it breathes almost. Yes, so this, with the environment. this was in a, in a food rod that was only on its second use. So relatively new, and if you put, uh, you know, wine into a second use barrique of 225 litres, you would end up with still quite a lot of oak influence. But because this is three and a half thousand litres, you have a really large volume of wine to a small surface area of oak. So the oak is not the important, well, the oak flavour is not the important thing and you actually don't get a lot. Start tasting, if you can taste, if you think that's oaky, um, we might beg to differ. Yeah. But it, it's, it's not clearly apparent. But it does add texture, it adds what we call phenolics, tannins, that change the mouth feel. Um, it's, it's not, doesn't have cooling on it, so the temperature in, during fermentation is a bit warmer. Uh, so there's all these little get, things. Did you say, is this a wild ferment on the... It starts wild, it starts wild. Uh, to, get, to get, again, a little bit of complexity in there and then the, it gets uh, yeast put into it. Yeah, fervently up there, there's, there's yeast cells floating around in the air everywhere. There's yeast on you now. Yep, and, and what we tend to do is when the grapes come in at harvest time, instead of sulphuring and, and removing that indigenous yeast that comes in on the grapes, we'll let it flourish yeah. and start the fermentation. What tends to happen though is that the commercial yeast that we use in the winery tend to take that over in the later stages, Regardless. which is actually which is actually a better process because they're very efficient at higher alcohols and all that sort of stuff. You don't end up with sweet wine. Everywhere. No, you don't You don't want any sweet wines, but certainly just back on the mountain range one, just yep. quickly. And Ed, just quickly, with Cuffy's ass, which one do you prefer? Well, it's, I, look, I was just going to mention on the mountain range actually, I just, one of the characteristics of this one that's since almost day dot is very much a, an apple pear, mm -hmm. almost sometimes in some years a strudely, you know, spiced apple and pear character that comes through on the wine. And I think that's despite the fact that it's perhaps toned down a little bit in the mountain range these days just because of the wine making, um, it certainly is very much apparent. And I really like the freshness and cleanness, how, how bright that, that wine is. However, saying that, I'm certainly, in terms of if I was sitting down with something to eat, I'd probably head towards the topography. Yeah, I'm all over the topography. Yeah. I'm, I'm, um, you know, so, sometimes Pinot Gris in the wider world can leave me a bit flat. Yep. Um, but that topography, uh, I must say I'm a bit proud of that. I'd, I'd happily drink that. And having said that, 2000, you're really lucky in that 2019, I, I first made Pinot Gris in... Uh, 2002 or oh, over uh, a previous. in a previous life um, 2019 without doubt the best Pinot Gris vintage ever there you go so um, uh, you a know. nice vintage to launch the topography in yeah. because I mean, uh, there's really I think there's a nice differentiation between those two mm -hmm. and, and you know especially with food the topography is really good I mean I guess the real, the real sort of standout difference for me is the texture yep. on the palate. You know, the ability to, to, to linger, to, to have a bit more body, yep. um, starting to push into that viscosity kind of area. I remember early days when we first started making some Pinot Gris, we had a look at some Alsatian versions, which were very pink and very oily, yep. almost like treacly honey on your yep. palate. And I would never advocate heading that far down the path. That's what the Botrytis does. Yes, I, I know that. I think it's all, th you know, little bits of everything. Yeah, everything yeah, in moderation, is, I think, is the key. Yeah, yeah. Um, certainly. Um, how would that wine have differed 
had it been made in hogsheads or a different different size oak, do you think? Um, yeah, good question. Um, we have in the past uh, fermented, you know, bits of the mountain range in older hogsheads uh, and breeks, and there is an appreciable difference between that and what's in tank. I think this just accentuates it more. I think it just pushes the that characteristic a bit more, and so you get that textural richness. I, I have recollections in the past of some of the earlier grease that we made having a little bit because they're in smaller rack barrels, having a bit of an oaky yeah. undertone. Yeah. And whilst that was all fine and well, I, I think I do prefer the effect that the oak has without the oak influence. Yeah, because uh, uh, what, what I keep the word I keep coming back to is texture. And yeah. texture, when I first did my first vintage, winemakers never talked about texture, and all of a sudden everyone's talking about texture. And texture is the the, the tactile sensation in your mouth. Um, you can have liney acidic textures. Uh, that you often find in Riesling, uh, and you get you get drier, more phenolic textures in in typically wines where all the tannins aren't fined out of it or have been into barrel. So Chardonnays, uh, some Sauvignon Blancs uh, that have been barrel fermented, and I see it in the topography Pinot Gris because it because of its fermentation method, it has that little touch of tannin which just dries and lengthens the palate and gives it a different texture. Mm. Um, a, a question that came ahead of time was food matching. Ah, yes. Um, and one of the great things I think about Pinot Gris is its food matching. Ability um, to match with... It matches lots of stuff. Good There's good. almost nothing it doesn't match. Um, and it struck me... Uh, a long time ago when I went to China to, to promote Printy Wines, I went to Shanghai. And pre, pre COVID 19. Pre COVID, well, pre COVID, this any is wet, this any a decade wet, ago. Any wet markets? No, visited didn't, that didn't no, see no, any. No, um, so, over there, as we all know and love, there's the Lazy Susan. And, and that's just not a Chinese Australian invention, they actually exist in China. Um, and the Chinese are really, in China, uh, um, all about prestige. So they all go for the, for the Bordeaux wines and Burgundy and what have you. And what they really need, in my opinion, is a bit more Pinot Gris because you've got, I don't know, 10 or 12 dishes on the table all at once. All different. All different flavours and textures. Yep. Uh, and Pinot Gris would be such a winner because it makes, yeah. it makes everything easy. Likewise, in Australia, when you go out to, when restaurants reopen and you go out to dinner, and you've got six or eight people at the table and you decide let's yeah. buy a bottle and share it. Some people love or hate Sauvignon Blanc, love or Chardonnay. hate Chardonnay. Yeah. Yeah. Pinot Gris right in the middle. matches everything that everybody has ordered individually. Certainly, certainly when Sauvignon Blanc was, you know, on its, as we, as we call it, the Savalanche. <laughs> yes. um, and we were doing a lot of wine taste, wine dinners and people would ask us to put Sauvignon Blanc matched with something. That was very much a head scratch, and we, there were about one or two things that we ever came up with, you know, that, that were, were good with Sauvignon Blanc. Goat's but, cheese and asparagus. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> um, whereas it's, it's a much better and more open field now, we yep. can agree. Yeah, um, And we certainly see um, a lot more ability to match. And I, as I often say, it's, this tends to, often things like Sauvignon Blanc, because they're so punchy and in your face, they, they compete for space on your palate. Yes. And so when you're eating food, it just wants to sit over the top of all the food flavours, whereas this co tends to complement yep. really nicely yep. a broad range of food. So that didn't answer the question at all, except to say that it goes with You water. can hardly go wrong. You I mean, know. okay, uh, uh, a mooing steak, fair enough. Yeah. But in terms of, you know, chicken, fish, salad, but even Chinese food, Asian food, curry, curries, soft uh, cheese. I can, yeah. I can put quite a lot of stuff. It, it, in there. It's one of the most versatile food wines going. Yeah, I don't disagree. Um, and someone, uh, Tanil on Instagram, oh. has said that uh, she loves the fact that topography is vegan. Yes, so um, oh, this is a much vexed thing. It is vegan because we have not, at, well, we say vegan friendly because we've changed our, our practices in the winery so that we're not 
adding any um, animal de derived fining agents. So, you know, traditionally, and has gone on for centuries, that things like um, egg whites, um, Isinglass. Isinglass, which is the swim bladder of sturgeon fish, uh, and uh, milk have been used to fine out tannins. Um, in the last couple of years, the, the producers of these fining agents have researched their bums off and have come up with some really good fine and really effective fining agents that are using pea protein, yeah, vegetable based, uh, vegetable -based um, or yeast derived um, proteins. Um, so we now have um, more options available for effective uh, fining on the wines and we've adopted universally those um, uh, finding agents across all our red and white wines from the 2019 vintage. It's um, it's probably a, an argument for another day around the minimal winemaking, natural winemaking, and all that sort of stuff. And but vegan and, and organic, and, yep, and, all, and all that sort of stuff. But, but it's certainly it's certainly a policy that's been in place with us for a time. That is, you know, in terms of minimal intervention, we don't do anything that's not required. We don't go well, over and above. The any, minimum amount of anything that's added. Any self-respecting winemaker who is trying to produce the best quality wine they can will do the least amount to it that they have to to meet yeah. that, uh, that quality benchmark that they have. Uh, it's interesting that the cheapest wines, so the, the stuff in supermarkets going for the bargain price, usually require the most, the most work, work. <laughs> yeah. the most additions, the most interference, and the premium wines, because they're made from quality grapes and the winemaker has a very clear objective about what they're, where they're going and what they're doing with it, usually require the far less interference. The wines, no wine actually just makes itself, no. but it's certainly less. Well, it's, less often a, it's often a saying, though, that we, we do bandy around the winery, though, is that often the good wines do tend to make themselves, not literally, yeah. of course, but they stand out yep. quite early on and quite, quite obviously um, from the get-go. Well, and, and we often tend to, like you just said, we put a lot of work into the, the ones that we're like, oh, we get the least money for this. Oh, yeah, and, we, and, and Printy... Printy doesn't sell wine sub $10. No. Um, and those wines require a huge amount of inputs and a huge amount of work. Mm -hmm. So uh, certainly, yeah, look, we do only what we have to. Yeah. Um, what I neglected to mention at the beginning was that there are a few great people who are following us, have, have been tuning in every week. Um, Mark Gibson is, big thumbs up to you, Mark. Hopefully you're watching today. You've, he's tuned in and bought every tasting pack to date and been very active, so mate, we thank you very much. Um, there are also a couple of birthdays, I think, being celebrated. Cheers. Um, and so hopefully one or both of these are gonna go down really nicely um, for you on your birthday. Um, and of course, there's, there's offers and stuff that we're doing on the back of these things with the... Um, Isn't there a canine viewing audience as well? There, okay. there possibly is a canine on. It's our first audience. dog yep. viewer. I'm, I'm not quite sure what the dog is going to get out of it. But hey, you know, if that I tickles his fancy. The dog is for three it. years old, but in human years, well, that's 21 years. So we thought well, that is okay. You, yeah. Uh, the right well, I think it's probably, look, knowing most dog owners, you know, that it's probably the owner needs. <laughs> He needs the validation from the dog that drinking at four o'clock on a Friday afternoon is fine. Or maybe in these lockdown days, uh, the dog is the only person left willing to, to talk, talk and spend talk time with the owner. Yep. Cuffy. Quite, quite possibly. Um, so. Yes, the dog's name is Sarge, and apparently yeah. he's loving it. Sarge, yeah. Sarge. yeah. Oh, you're drooling everywhere, <laughs> no doubt. Um, have you any, any wine related questions, Emma? Uh, yes, Tennille, who I think recently had a birthday, uh, as one of those birthday shout outs, has, uh, yep, yeah, she's quite interested in learning more about the vegan, organic uh, topic. That, uh, that's like a webinar be, all in it itself. Is. So, you know, perhaps we can. We'll put it on the agenda. Put that on the agenda for down the track for one of our other tastings, but I think that's certainly a topic of the moment that everyone's interested in. Um, Everyone seems to be enjoying it. Uh, I've had a comment that the topography is 
is, has been described as the jack of all trades. That no. it's it's got a bit more personality. Well, I think I think that, and the reason for asking for two glasses and suggesting two glasses is because these are both from the same year, grown quite close together, mm. and and yet in the glass there's there's vast differences, and and it's just the ability to highlight that you know both on the nose and the palate, um, just how how different that is, and 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 therefore what the influence that that winemaking has and harvesting decisions has and maturation has and all, it's all these the little things that all come together. Things. That's right. Unusually for us in the, the topography series, most of our wines are numerous sites or numerous picks going in to make up, you know, batches of wine. But the topography wines tend to be single single vineyard, um, often single pick. Um, wines and so and often single vessels so yeah. a, lot of, a lot of the topography uh, wines go into we've, we've now got uh, eight about three and a half thousand litre fooders it'd be nice to be able to do one in front of those one day maybe, Ass maybe assistant could. assistant can we do a filming Stig in front can of organize the, that the, the fooders one day maybe yes, absolutely as the backdrop yeah, that'd be nice. um, and then then we can go to punchins yes different barrel or hogsheads, a yes. different barrel again. Uh, uh, maybe that's why of incorporating a winery tour into a virtual tasting, as yeah. we can reference the. Uh, ma idea. Maybe we should do a topography tasting of all with the fooders in the background, yeah. where we just take it out of the <laughs> yeah, out of the sample tap. We could. <laughs> now I've got two questions. Uh, just following on from the vegan topic, which sounds um, like there is quite a bit of interest. Have, do we get a lot of queries about our wines being vegan? The, they seem to come in spurts. Yeah, look, the reason, the reason we ended up making these wines vegan friendly is because questions were asked. At the time, originally, I, I recall, you know, uh, maybe four or five years ago when the first questions got asked around vegan wines, the options really weren't there. No, we we couldn't have actually produced one. Whereas today we can, and from our perspective, we've made a wine of no lesser quality. And in fact, you know, in, in these in the nineteen wines, I think we've made some beautiful wines, um, and getting the added bonus of being being friendly along the way. So we certainly um, we certainly been quite happy with the results it, from that. Th these things have to evolve. Yep. So you know. Um, it, it also means that if you get the first, the first time you get asked, uh, is sort of like, well, okay, but how big is that market? Yep. And, and is it possible? Are the products available, the finding products available to do it? The answer may be no, yep. but in a couple of years, as well, we found, and that things was, changed. That was the case early on. Yeah. And certainly there's been a lot of work going to that. And I have no doubt that in the future there's gonna be better products. Oh, they'll, they'll keep evolving it. And I think the right. uptake has been you know, across wine producers has been quite good. Yeah, so. okay. Uh, and another question from Facebook. Um, what is the optimal temperature to serve these wines? Oh, yeah, look, I personally, I'm not a fan of really chilling wines. Um, you've got to remember that the colder something is, um, the less you will taste and the less complexity and the less detail you will see in whatever beverage it is. So if it's crap, chill the bejesus out of it because <laughs> it'll make it more palatable. Okay. That especially goes for beer on tap. But um, I guess the point to make is in the winery and in the winemaking process, it's only ever at ambient temperature. Yeah, we do all our work at essentially ambient temperature. So. In the middle of winter, yes, that's quite cool, but in the middle of summer, it's, you know, In the middle of winter, be, be, be. Being, being orange and the wine temperature in the winery can drop to six degrees, which is about what a f domestic fridge is. Uh, if I've got to do wine trials, I'll, I'll go and get them a couple of hours before the samples and sit them on the bench in the office so they actually warm up. The aim for us, though, is to see all the lumps and bumps. Yeah. You know, so we need them at their peak temperature to see, you know, to get the, the right nose and taste and all that sort of stuff. Having said that, I'll, I'd like all you guys, though, to see all the detail that, are, yeah. that is in the wine. So, look, you know, put, 
a white wine like this, put it in the fridge, and once once you you open it and start drinking it, don't put it back in the fridge. Yeah. Just let it warm up on your kitchen bench or on your dinner you'll, table. You'll actually notice that the wine opens up and changes yeah. quite a lot. You know, there's a couple of factors there. The fact that it's been opened and now exposed to to the air, um, but also the rising temperature. Yeah. And now, see, if you're sitting on the terrace on a 35 degree day, perhaps a nice bucket. <laughs> perhaps a nice bucket. <laughs> But especially at this time of year, just on the table as you're drinking it, no need to put it in ice or an ice bucket or back in the fridge. Just no. And, and watch the wine evolve in your glass and, and in the bottle. Certainly, bottom. these ones here, I put in the fridge earlier today, but only for a couple of hours. And now they've been out for a couple of hours before we've actually um, drunk them. And they're not cold, but I'd, I'd say that's... They've got a chill, but they're not warm. Yeah, that's yeah. right. And that's... That's and it's also temperature wise, you know, 12, 13, 14 degrees. Yeah. Certainly doesn't need to be straight out of the fridge at four degrees. No. So, we've had quite a bit of interest in, uh, yes, we should do a bit of a tour of the winery, talk more about the barrels, what's in the barrels. So, the assistant just needs to work out how I can. I, I think if walk we incorporate. With three phones. Well, I don't <laughs> think you can unless you grow an extra arm. <laughs> Uh, so maybe like doing a topography tasting in front of yeah. uh, of the fooders and we can explain that and then we can do a different part of the winery on a different day and explain that. Just means you have to watch them all to having, join all the pieces of the puzzle together. Having said that, the assistant is very talented. <laughs> and look, I wouldn't Three put, arms, I wouldn't she's going to get growing. I wouldn't put anything past her. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and actually the assistant received a question, thank you Tennille, she was wondering what my favourite uh, Pinot Green was and I think I would go topography, I just think... That's, that's three out of three. Yes, so there's a distinct favouritism there. It is a bit of a, it's a bit of a, you know, a new and shiny object new too. New and shiny toy. Which, is, which may be, may be mis, you know, dragging our attention off. The work the mountain the mountain yeah. Well, look, horses yeah. for courses as well. Um, um, always, back in the day when we ran a real cellar door, <laughs> before this shenanigans, um, you know, I'd, people came in and, and, you know, there's quite a few wines, you can't taste them all. So I often did them in pairs, you know, mountain range with topography yeah. type yeah. thing. And I, lots of people preferred the mountain range. Okay, it's cheaper and uh, made in bigger volumes, but that's horses for courses. I'm I'm not offended if because I make them both and one's more expensive, or I think one is a better yeah, wine. Yeah. Yeah. If someone goes, oh, you know, the, I prefer the mountain range. Perfectly good. Perfectly good response. Yeah. Yeah. Don't mind. No. So um, now a reminder for next Friday. I can't believe we've done like four of these or something already. Cabernet. Mm. Cabernet. Yeah. yeah, and and I overheard that our viticulturist. So that'll be a mountain range and a topography. topography. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I heard I overheard Charlie mention today that next week we're getting cold. So oh yeah, tell me about it. Like we we'll might, be we'll be lucky to be in double figures temperature yeah. wise. Less than ten, most towards the end of next week. Uh, so Cabernet might be spot on, for, <laughs> for, certainly for this environment. Can we um, have a fire going between the barrels? Perhaps. Or something? perhaps. Um, so, remember Friday Tasting code online if you'd like to order anything. It actually goes across. Does the deal keep getting better? 15% off no, what, shipping? No, what does keep getting better is this. <laughs> the repartee. Yeah, the repartee. <laughs> and, our, and next week we think we might have a microphone. Ooh, that'd be modern so, technology. So, that might really ham things up. Right, so, um, so uh, just to recap. Is it still free delivery even for one bottle across the country? Correct. Yes, but order 12 at a time. I mean, <laughs> uh, so we've got the, a separate one is the Friday tastings, which is 15% off and free shipping. Yes. Uh, there is also uh, Mother's Day. So for Ooh. people with the Mother's orange postcode, the 2800. Postcode, you you can order a bottle of Swift Rosé. Oh, big news on sparkling too. I'll come back to that. Um, uh, you get a bottle of Swift Rosé and a bunch of flowers delivered to your door. From, to from a local flower farm here. So. From a local yeah, Mayfield farm flowers. So, and that's on Mother's Day. That, that is happens. on Mother's Day. Right, so any more deals that, is, that I've missed? That is service. <laughs> that is service. 
does have to be within the 2800 postcode. That is for local If you're in Perth, me. I'm sorry. But we, we did can send a still uh, write a lovely the message if you're not yeah, around that's true. So That's true. Um, uh, if I missed any other deals. Oh, I don't think so. Uh, and the, there is the wine club, you know, so there's, there's benefits and discounts with the wine club. Now, sparkling news. Yes. Um, a lot of wine shows across the country have been uh, cancelled, uh, such as the Sydney Royal Wine Show, which um, you know is one of the biggest in the country, which is unfortunate due to COVID-19. There are a couple still happening. We happen to win uh, another trophy with the Swift Vintage 2012, winning the WineWise uh, Sparkling Wine of the Year. So WineWise is a um, um, wonderful publication that comes out of Canberra. It's been going for donkey's years, Lester Jesberg, hope you're watching. Uh, and basically you have to win a gold medal, yeah. at, a, a medal at, a, at another capital wine city. show. Lot, mostly capital city? No, that's the national wine show. Okay. Um, but it's pretty much invitation only. Lester goes through and says, yes, um, we'd love to, you can enter, we'd love to see your wine. Um, so I'm not quite sure what other sparkling wines from around the country were in that competition, but uh, needless but to say, the Swift it. Vintage 2012 came out on top. So that um, is the tenth trophy for Swift sparkling wines in the last couple of years. No, we've been That's very true. happy with how they've been running. Um, um, now we've had uh, just a couple of questions we'll put in quickly. How long will the 2019 last for? Oh, uh, going you... on previous vintages? A while? Is this a question of how long will it be available to purchase or how long would it be available, you know, like how long will it Let's keep? Let's cover both. Ah. They, the mountain range is made to drink as a, as a, a younger wine. Um, the topography will certainly do, what, you know, five to seven? Oh, yeah. I think yeah. it'll be really interesting to see in five years' time and that whole richness sort of yeah. gets accentuated with bottle age. With the keep in mind, with... Um, with the mountain range though, um, we, we hold small stocks back and, and that's always looked really good after a couple of years. So, you know, uh, it, it'll last. In terms of sales, well, um, no we do make quite a bit of it and there's no 2012. 20, 2020. 2020. 2020. 2020. 2020. I've got trophies on No, there's a lot of 2019, yeah. so never fear. We're, we're not gonna run out anytime we're, soon. We're not about to run out. Um, but saying that, you're right, there was no 20. 20. So uh, we'll go 19, 21 eventually. Yep. Um, but uh, yeah, that's safe. Safe for the moment. Yep. Yes. Yep. Good supplies. Yep. Getting my can. Yep. And I've had lots of, of lots, lots, I can't talk, of offers of assistance to help me carry the cameras around Ooh. the winery tour. So. <laughs> uh, you've got to be 1.5 on metres apart. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, no, uh, we, we can. Um, we, we, we can work out a way to to show you bits of the wine. We'll, sure. we'll yeah. work on that and we'll but thank you for the put offer. that out in a couple of weeks, I think. What would be better is when, when all this blows over, everyone comes and visits and you can actually see it for yourself. Yes. That would be nice too. But um, we'll sort something out in the meantime. Yeah, sort something out in the meantime. Um, so, look, thank you very much for joining us today. Pinot Gris turns out to be quite a complex beast. Um, Yes, lots of variants, um, and and also you know very popular. So hope you enjoyed that today. Next week Cabernet, and and the current tasting pack. So this is the, the first week of Correct. the current tasting, the tasting pack. pack too. But if you still want to order a tasting pack, it still does another three weeks because we have two Cabernets next week, yep. and then the two tastings following that a single bottle tasting. Correct. So there's still three weeks left yep. in the current tasting pack. That's correct. So look, enjoy your weekends everybody and um, we'll see you next week. Have a good weekend.